Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kai. I'm a hacker from Bochum. And um, today I'm here to tell about a bit about my open source project I did, uh, which is called Panopticon, which is a cross-platform disassembler written in Rust. So what's a disassembler? Um, when you're programming in high-level languages like Rust or C or C++, um, what you do is you write your code in your high-level language, and then use a compiler to transform this high-level representation into a lower-level le representation that's actually um, executable by the CPU. Um, this transformation is compilation, and uh, what you get out is assembly language. Um, assembly language has m not much of the features you have in your high-level representation. Um, in the middle plane, you can see how this looks like. Um, it always starts with a shorthand for the instruction, in this case, SUB. And um, after this, uh, the arguments to the instruction. So um, SUB is the shorthand. It's also called the mnemonic um, for subtract. And after that comes RSP. That's a um, symbolic name for an internal memory area in the register, uh, called register. And um, after that, there comes some immediate value. Um, so we subtract from RSP the value hexadecimal 18. And um, this goes on and on. Um, there are no ifs or loops. Uh, when you do control flow, you um, have some specific branch instructions where that tells you, um, well, I make this check, and depending on the outcome of this check, I either uh, continue on with the instruction or start um, at another memory address. And um, after you have this assembly code, uh, you use this assembler that turns this text representation into a binary representation and the CPU can actually read. Um, this is a more or less one-to-one -one mapping. Um, well, what a disassembler does is it reverses this last step. So um, you give it a binary, that's a binary representation of the code, and it gives you a text representation you can actually read and analyze. Um, why would you want to do this? Um, most of the time, you're in a situation where you have a program and you want to know things about this program, but you don't have to source code. So this is often the times um, proprietary software and malware. And um, with proprietary software, it's often that the software has some network protocol implemented or reads a certain file format and you want to know how this works. So um, you disassemble it and try to figure out from the access patterns of the inside this application how this file format works. And other situations is like malware, we have already questions, how did malware get into the system, how does it spread, how does it hide from the user, and how does it get its, um, out the author, give them malware and, uh, information how to what to do. Um, so, Panopticon is not the first application to do this. Um, all the disassembler you can use now roughly fall into three categories. Um, you have rather simple tools like Object Dump or LLMC. Um, these are often parts of uh, larger compiler packages, and they're only there for um, analyzing the stuff the compiler puts out. So um, what they essentially do is you give them a binary and it spits out all of the um, code it finds in there onto your console, and there's not much more, so there's no analysis done. Um, then you have research prototypes, so this whole binary analysis field is an active field of research, and um, there's a lot of research going into what analysis you can do on these binaries, and um, often these are implemented in research prototypes, either by single PhD students or whole groups. Um, these things are very impressive, um, but they're not really there to be used by non-expert users. Um, so they're often hard to deploy, they're always lacking documentation, and, um, if it, and if you didn't read the research papers, you won't be able to use them. And um, then there are the commercial offerings that are a middle ground between those two. They're always easy to deploy and use, and they have parts documented, um, but they are not extensible. So um, it's proprietary software. They have sometimes some kind of plugin API where you can use some things, where you can change some parts, but not everything. And these cost obscene amounts of money. So Panopticon is there to solve all of these three problems at once. <laughs> um, the whole project started around 2009, where I wanted to analyze some proprietary um, firmware application, and um, I thought, well, I just use a disassembler, there must be millions of them, and no, none of them were actually usable on my machine. So there were some open source tools that weren't there yet, and there were the commercial offerings that didn't work on Linux. So I thought to myself, so well, just build one. How hard could it be? Uh, <laughs> turns out it's surprisingly hard. <laughs> um, I was once told that you have to build one to throw away, 
and um, to make sure I built three of them through an all the way. And um, between 2009 and 2011, I did a lot of research, reading into how to build these kind of things, and what to analyze the stuff you can do on them. And um, sometimes I programmed myself into the corner where I couldn't get out. And sometimes these prototypes were never meant to be really extensible. Um, so in 2011, I actually started with the real thing. And um, I started with C++. Um, at that time, the evolution of C++ started to um, improve the C++ standard again. And um, I thought, well, I'll just use that. Um, until 2015, I programmed this thing, and it grew to a size of around 10,000 lines of code. And um, then Rust came, and Rust solved pretty much all of the problems I had with C++. And um, it took me around three months to uh, convince myself that, again, taking all this code, um, I was the single maintainer and the single contributor to this project at the time, and throwing it all away and writing it again alone uh, was the best thing you can do. And um, I'm here to convince you this is what's really a great idea. <laughs> so in June I started, and um, the porting went really good, and I was surprised how fast it was. And um, in October I was at the point that the Rust version of Panopticon has the same feature set as the C++ version. Um, and actually, I ported 10,000 lines, but the result were only 8,000, so I got rid of a lot of code, um, mostly because Rust allows me to pattern matching and use some types. I mean, you can use something like some types in C++, but this means you have to do template meter programming, um, which is very hard to use and gets you very much code, and it's not really fun to use. Um, so this is some boring metrics about the current state of the project. What's maybe a bit interesting is um, the test coverage actually went up far, far to uh, 70%. This is not good, but it's definitely better than before. I had 50% maybe. And um, this is mostly because testing in, C in Rust is very easy. You can just put your tests in line with the code. Um, with C++, you always have to use some kind of testing framework, and you have some uh, separate project where you put all your tests in. So you have to remember to test all your functions. And um, this wasn't working for me, at least. And OK, well, thanks to Hacking News, I have 980 worthless internet points on GitHub. So what's the current state of the project? Um, it is in graphical output, so you can open up it like a normal desktop application. Um, you can open an ELF file, which is the standard format for binaries on Unix systems. Um, and it would start to disassemble. You start at the entry point, and then follow the control flow and look what uh, um, instructions do I find there. And um, what you get is a list of functions. And when you click on the functions, you get something that's um, pictured here, which is a control flow graph. So you have these boxes. Each box represents one sequence of um, assembly code that's executed always um, to the end. So you know there are no jumps into, inside this box, and there are no com one coming out aside from the end. Um, this really helps you to follow the control flow throughout this program and analysis. So what you can do then is um, add comments to the sides of the assembly code, and when you figured out what the function does, you can give it a name. So when it's, for example, in the proprietary application, you see a function, okay, that reads a file and starts a magic number on the um, beginning, you can name the function, so read the magic number. Um, Panopticon can analyze x86 um, code, that's the one you have in your um, laptop, and then RV AVR, which is some 8-bit microcontroller that's, for example, used in the um, Arduino platform, and um, MOS6502, which is the um, microcontroller you find in C64 microcomputers. And um, well, that's pretty much it for now. So why, how did this conversion go? Um, it was really fun. Um, I have experience with C++ and Tesca and so, and um, comparing to them, this was really fun writing Rust and learning Rust. Um, what I really liked at the beginning was these, the helpful compiler messages. Um, for example, I, when I learned Rust, I just opened the book and read it maybe to the 50% and then started to dive in. And um, when you start program in Rust, you f sooner or later come to a point where you have to use something like named lifetimes. And um, 
where I started to use and made, made a structure with some reference in there and then didn't compile and the compiler says, well, that doesn't work here. And, um, but it also tells me, so why don't you try it? And added life, and named lifetime, had no idea what this is, but I just copied the stuff and in my editor and it worked. And um, while this is probably not the best way to learn language, um, it really helped me to get over this initial bump in the learning curve and really got me interested. This is, for example, different from Haskell, where you also have these helpful compiler messages, but when you do what the compiler tells you, you only get a longer error message. And <laughs> gets nowhere. <laughs> and um, Cargo really helped me with development and deployment of the application. So in C++, when you have a dependency to your application and people want to compile your tool, they have to download every single dependency and compile it. And um, under Windows, you even have no packet manager, so you really have to go on the site, download the zip file, uh, compile it, set up all the paths so Visual Studio finds the binaries. And this makes deployment very, very hard. Um, so I had to think very hard about every dependency I put in my project. And the result was I had pretty much no dependency except Qt for um, the graphic user output. Um, with Cargo, it's way, way easier um, to put de dependencies in there because Cargo just downloads it at runtime, uh, at compile time, and fig figures out how to configure Visual Studio to everything compiles. And, um, this way, I could reuse code, much of the code um, that was already done by the community, and this really accelerated the uh, um, porting of the code. And while well, huge community growth, I'm really impressed um, how many packages are in this cargo ecosystem now compared to one year ago. Um, so I'm starting to throw away code I wrote, uh, for example, reading these ELF uh, structures and use code done by others that most of the time is written better and maintained as opposed to the stuff I write in Proticon that's more write-ons. And um, yes, less bugs. So um, getting bugs off the application is always hard, especially in C++. And um, when I started porting my code, I had a situation where I ported some functions, and um, Panopticon has its own graphing library, so um, in order to display these graphs you saw at the beginning, um, there's a wall library in there. And um, well, there was some function to, do reef some, to remove something load from them. So what I do is just iterate through all the edges, remo removing it one by one, and then removing the node. So pretty straightforward. And um, I ported this function uh, to Rust, this is C++ code, and it didn't compile. So borrow check attack me. So here, something borrow, I have no idea what happened, but it didn't, comp didn't compile. So I did what I always do when the borrow checker, uh, when I can't appease the borrow checker, I started cloning things. And cloning things more and more and more and more. And at the end, I was um, at the point where I just copied the whole container, deleted parts one by one, and then it worked. And um, this was the first time I actually looked a bit more deeper into this borrow checking thing. And um, I realized that in the C++ code, there was an iterator invalidation problem. Um, what you have in C++ is that you have iterators, as in Rust, um, but they are not borrow checked or something like that. So you just get two pointers, and you start incrementing the pointer until you get to an end. And um, when you mutate the container, the, um, these pointers come from, these are invalidated. So they are just pointers to internal data structures, and when you change something in the container, these pointers stop being valid, and you have to get new pointers. Um, if you don't do this, bad things will happen, maybe. If you're lucky, the application blows up at runtime. If you're unlucky, like me, nothing happens and all your tests work. And um, if we free, with Rust, of course, it doesn't work because the um, iterator has a reference and a borrow on the container. And when you try to uh, mutate the container, it tells you, well, there's some borrow on this container. Just invalidate this um, iterator first. And um, this was the first time where I saw this, this borrow checking thing really finds bugs you find in real code bases. And this is something that is not very exotic in C++ code bases, you find this all the time. Um, other things I was able to get out of the code base was data races. So there is some multi-threading in there, but not much, uh, mostly because when you write multi-threading code in C++, you never know uh, whenever there's a bug or a data race in there, um, aside if you just put their mutex is everywhere in order to make it more or less um, a single thread application. Um, when, I compile in when I compile this thing in Rust, I know that there are certain bugs in there that can't happen. And this really helped me um, to give me the courage to use more multi-threading. Um, then integer overflows. 
Um, as you may know, when you do an integer overflow inside um, a debugging build of Rust application, the application panics. And this, when you do this in a real release application, it works. Um, in Panopticon, there's some part that more or less emulates what the CPU does, so it really executes the instructions. And um, overflowing integers are pretty commonplace in this um, assembly language, so you really use it explicitly um, to do certain things faster. Uh, so I had to wrote, write a lot of wrapping code to keep the debugging applications from blowing up at runtime. Um, this was pretty annoying. Uh, I understand that my special uh, case is probably not the general case, so if you have normal applications, integer overflows are probably not so good, great. Um, but for me, I'm not sure whenever um, it's what really worth the work. So one of the features I really love about Rust and misuse a lot are uh, macros. Um, I come from C++, as you may have heard. And um, in Rust, in, uh, in C++, you use template meter programming a lot um, to do certain things at compile time. And um, in Rust, you can use these macros that has the upside that they were actually designed to do things at compile time instead of with C++ template programming where it was more or less more an accident. And um, well, when you're writing disassembler, what you actually do is writing some um, machine that looks for certain patterns in the bitstream, and when it finds a pattern, it generates some structure that um, tells the disassembler, so well, this is the mnemonic x, y, this is the arguments, and so on. So um, in AVR, for example, you have um, this operation, which is called ORI, which is or with immediate value. Um, we have two arguments which um, one of them is an immediate value and one of them is a register, and you just do a logical OR with these two values. And um, for each of these uh, uh, operations in AVR, which is a very small uh, CPU, you have only 100 of them, um, you have to write some matching code. And um, with the microsystem, I was able to build something that more or less looked like the matching um, matches you find in the reference documentation. So on the uh, upper half, you see how it looks like in the reference documentation. And on the lower side, it's the, um, how it looks with this macro. So it's pretty much the same. Um, you can more or less copy um, from the reference documentation into this macro. And that makes it easy to check whenever these things are correct. Because when you for mix up one bit, for example, um, it doesn't work. And um, where you have in this macro, you have the pattern. And then you um, assign a function to it. So what happens is that when, the Rust, uh, when Panopticon finds this pattern, it calls the function, and the function creates all the metadata. Um, another situation where I have code generation with macros is um, when I'm generating analysis code. So um, what Panopticon does a bit better than, for example, object dump is that it can understand what a mnemonic or an operation on the CPU actually does. Um, this enables us to do a bit more analysis, for example. It can tell you how data flows throughout the application because it knows um, what the individual inst instructions do. And in order to do this, you need to define some kind of intermediate language, um, like in a compiler. So the disassembler part generates this intermediate instruction set that's built to be easily analyzable. And um, then you have the analysis part that just works on this analyzable instruction set. It knows nothing about uh, um, uh, CPU instructions. And um, Panopticon uses Rail, this is R-R-E-I-L, um, which is kind of a standard. And um, I built a macro, which was more or less derivation from another macro that was an assembler for MOS uh, 6502. And um, I'm a bit proud of it, because it more or less looks like the Rail you find in the um, PhD uh, students' applications or in the research papers. So it, again, you can just copy your stuff into the macro and, and makes it easy to verify whenever it works correctly. There are some things I don't like about Rust currently. Um, the GUI libraries aren't that good. So um, doing graphical output is really hard. There are libraries to draw your rectangle on the screen, but when you need complex widgets, um, that's really hard to do. And um, I use QMLRS, which wraps the Qt library. And, um, this is, creates another problem because Qt is C++, and you can interact with C++ directly, so there's some C wrapping code in there that needs to compile it. And um, on the Windows, this needs to, means you need Visual Studio, which is 8 gigabytes in size or so, um, just to compile two files. 
And um, this makes it hard to deploy still for Panopticon. And um, then while Cargo is really great, it makes it hard to package this application for Linux distributions because normally Linux distributions don't allow you to at access the internet at build time. So what you have to do is to declare your dependencies beforehand and then they get downloaded to you, for you and then you use them how they're on disk and don't access the internet. Um, that's a problem the guys with Fedora and Debian have to solve. Um, but for me, that means I have to wait until the problem is solved um, before I can try to get the p official package into Debian, which is really important because the packages from Debian are the packages from Ubuntu and so on. And um, one last thing about, I really like macros, but I'm not sure how to use them often. Um, I wish there would be more documentation. For example, what's a token tree? For example, the tree part um, isn't really explained. I use it and I know how, what problems I can solve with it, but I don't really know how it works. So. Why I'm really here is to tell you about my project and hoping that you will may help me because it's still a 20,000 line project. Um, I'm programming more or less alone. Um, the barrier of entry is very low because my Rust is terrible. Um, there's a lot of unwrap in there and um, a lot of okay and unwrap. And um, just changing this to something like try or returning an error is already sufficient to get a uh, merge request in there. Um, so if you're interested, the website is panopticon.re. And um, I have a Twitter account for the project, um, which is panopticon underscore re, um, where I post about news and new releases about the project. And um, if you have questions a bit or are a bit shy, or maybe you have later questions, you can uh, send me an email. Um, my email address is seu at panopticon.re, or just follow me on Twitter and ask me there, which is underscore, C-I-B-O underscore. And that's it. <laughs>